Um, here we'll talk now about um, using EEG and MEG, or also intracranial EEG, basically electrophysiological signals to assess interactions between brain areas. Why is this important? It's because basically um, the brain, as you all probably know or guess, uh, it's more than just the sum of its parts. It's not different brain structures, uh, each one doing one task, and then they come together as an Lego piece and that's it. It's way more than that. And one way that the brain implements this being more than this, the sum of its parts, is the fact that there's these, there are these interactions that have a functional role. So brain areas interact with one another um, in different ways over time, depending on the task, depending on the state of the individual. Um, and so obviously we need to want to assess this and there are many, many metrics, many tools that exist for quantifying brain interactions. Um, and what I'm going to do now is just give you an overview of these techniques and try to provide you with, with some pointers um, to the strengths, uh, maybe some caveats, some limitations of some of these tools uh, in case you uh, consider either as part of this brain hack school or in another project that you're running now or in the future if you would like to look and try to assess interactions. So broadly speaking, there are three types of connectivity. So this, this is um, globally true, not only for the case of MEG or EEG, but typically we talk about anatomical connectivity. So these are structural links uh, between distinct neuronal populations. Um, we talk also about functional connectivity, and by functional connectivity we refer to information exchange between distinct populations or just distinct brain areas or brain regions. The third um, type of connectivity is what we refer to as effective connectivity. So effective connectivity is basically an assessment of the influence of one neuronal population over another. Is one brain area driving another? So is there an information flow, but just not of only that, but more than that, is can we um, infer the direction of the flow of information? Is the information flowing from parietal to prefrontal cortex? Is it flowing from visual areas to parietal areas? Just what is the direction of this connectivity? Okay, so that's the effective connectivity. So to summarize, ana an anatomical connectivity, functional connectivity, and thirdly, effective connectivity. And so to use um, an analogy or metaphor that Francisco Varela um, published in a Nature Reviews Neuroscience paper in 2001, um, he asked the question, how are the scattered mosaics of functionally specialized brain regions coordinated? Or in other words, um, another analogy beyond the mosaics is also to ask how is the complex symphony of neuronal processes orchestrated? So you can imagine that in each part of the brain, you have a specialized musician that is an expert in his instrument, okay? So this would be the functional specialization. Um, but so each, one, each of these areas that are highly specialized in given functions or processes, they just don't operate independently, right? For us to have a coherent behavior when we are move around in the environment, when we make decisions or when we interact with other individuals, for our, coherent, uh, for our behavior to be coherent, there needs to be interaction and exchange of information between these brain areas one of them is specialized let's say in vision the other one in motor the other one in memory but they need to interact they need to exchange information um, and so all everything we'll be talking about now is how does this actually happen at least from an electrophysiological perspective how do we try to assess this how can we try to measure these interactions between brain areas Okay, so um, basically the idea is that we are moving away from something we would like to call local functional specialization, which is, as I said, each brain area is um, specialized in a, a given um, process, to something which is on the, but the following the green arrow here, um, towards what we call large-scale integration. The exchange of information between brain areas is at the heart, the basis of what we call integration of information. Okay, so we integrate different pieces of information from different brain areas into a whole that allows us then to uh, make a decision, for example. And how do we do this? Well, one way that this has been proposed to function is by saying, well, you have, as you can see here in the image, 
two neuronal populations, one in the motor area and one more in the visual area. Okay. Um, each one has a number, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a local network, if you will. And so there can be local processing of information. And this would be more the local functional specialization at work. But then you will also expect to see an interaction, the flow of information between these two areas. And this is what we refer to as long range coupling. Okay, so this is a synchronization, an interaction between distant brain areas. And there are many mechanisms that have been proposed to, uh, to subtend this or to be at the, at the heart of, of, of how this occurs. Um, and to be able to tap into those, we need to have specific metrics. Okay, so um, given that this happens um, at a, a very high speed, generally talk, we're talking about millisecond range phenomena that happens that happen for these that, um, that govern these interactions. Um, ideally, um, it's not the only way, but ideally, if we are looking at interactions that happen in the millisecond range, we would like to have techniques that have that millisecond resolution to be able to capture those millisecond interactions. Just makes sense. Uh, one way of obviously of doing that, or ideally, if you want to capture um, electrophysiological phenomena, you'd be using EEG, MEG, or integrating EEG. So, what is the phenomenon that we'd like to measure? Broadly speaking, this is what we could call neuronal synchronization. Okay, so synchronization between populations in distant brain areas. Um, this stems from the 17th century, famous Dutch scientist Christian Huygens. He reported his observation that there are um, the synchronization of two pendulum clocks. So he had two pendulum clocks that he uh, positioned, as you can see here in the figure. And so they, there is, a, they're basically started randomly. Um, so there's no relation between the two pendulum clocks, but when he attached them to this common bar, obviously through some um, just very basic physical resonance effects, um, at, after some point, the two pendulum began to, um, to move in synchrony. And this is basically thought to be one of the very first reports of this notion of synchronization back in 1665. Um, you can see here in the figure several examples of synchronization. What we call in-phase synchronization is the first example. You see we have exactly the same phase for the two pendulum. Um, Anti-phase would be what you see on the right-hand side, the top right, where they're going against one another. So there's still a strong phase relationship. They're just anti-phase, okay? Um, thirdly, so it's the bottom left corner, synchronization with an arbitrary phase. So the phase difference between the two is arbitrary, but it's still always constant. So in this case here too, we have a synchronization. Um, on the bottom right, this is a case where there's no synchronization. In other words, here, each pendulum is independent of the other one. So this is just very simple cases of synchronization uh, between, um, between two oscillators. I'm going to con continue with some analogies. This is a uh, stadium. I think this is the uh, Lyon uh, Gerland uh, football stadium. Um, why I'm talking to you about this is because I think this provides a nice analogy. Basically, what you would you can try to imagine is that what you see here in the field, you can imagine the audience of the people attending to be each one of them an individual neuron, right? Um, and so what happens in the stadium is that people are talking, some are clapping, some are you know following the game, others are not. So there's a lot of noise. So if you bring down a microphone, a huge microphone, as you can see here in the image you'd be hearing this background overall noise that captures all this variability and could be close to something we might want to call, call white noise if it's entirely random. Um, but um, interestingly, if an event happens in the game, for example, a goal is scored, or it's the end of the game and the audience are trying to cheer and clap for their team to try and encourage them to make a goal before the game finishes you might see something emerge from the, the behavior of the people attending the game, for example, as some synchronous form of clapping like <laughs> When that happens, there is enough signal because there's some synchronization that there is a structure that becomes audible or can be captured by the recording microphone. Before any structure in the data, so if we don't have any structure, you'll only just basically be recording noise. As soon as there is some synchronous behavior in these individuals or in these neurons, then you will have a pattern that can be captured at the level of the, of the micro. 
if these patterns are there, but they're very different across all the individuals, again, at the level of the microphone, you'll just hear noise. What happens in reality when we're recording EEG, we don't have only one channel, we have several channels. So it, you can imagine you have several microphones um, and they will be recording um, the, the activity from different areas. And so you can tell, you can have an idea uh, of what's going on through this synchronization. So the condition for be able to measure this is a massive synchronization in the behavior of the crowd. Okay. Um, I'm going to continue with some analogies before now we come to the mathematical representations of these metrics to measure synchronization. Um, this analogy again is the one from Varela. So we're talking about the orchestra. Um, so you can imagine here that you have different sections of this uh, orchestra or the symphony where some are play, play, playing um, violins, uh, other play, are playing percussions, others are playing wind instruments, brass, and so on. Um, and there is some local coherence going on within each section, but there also there's a global coherence and, and a synchronization between the whole. Now, the question that often arises is the role of a conductor. Do we in the brain have some brain structure that plays the role of a conductor like in, in a symphony uh, or in orchestra? Is there somebody that's standing there telling everybody what to do and all the different sections, when to play what? Um, I think this is, um, again, a question that is often debated and uh, some people um, would like to believe that some structures such as the thalamus may be playing um, a role that could be close to a role of a, of a coordinator or a conductor. Um, and others believe that basically it's more of a transient and self-organized emergence of some synchronizations that transiently come and disappear over time that don't necessitate the, um, the need, where they don't need actually the presence of a conductor or a coordinator. Um, I very much like this, uh, this painting here on the right. This is by Justin Bua, um, and um, it's, a, it's, it's called the jam session. So I, I like the jam session analogy a bit more than the orchestra one for synchronization in the brain. I think different brain areas come together transiently um, for the need, given the context, and then it's like three players coming together, playing a tune, improvising, but in a coherent way. And then these could go along and spread and we'll be playing with other musicians and so on and so forth, without necessarily having a conductor um, or a music sheet telling them exactly what to do. Um, <clears throat> I, again, uh, I want to go quickly through one example to illustrate why it can be of interest to, um, to look at um, interaction between brain areas. This is a study with MEG. Um, I, you know, maybe it was EG. I think this is an EG study, yes, where um, the, um, the authors, what they did is they, the, I'm going to show you the task first. Um, they had individuals compare um, an image on a screen um, to a sensory, um, uh, to sensory information that they had under their fingers. Basically, they were using these dots that come from a braai. This is what is used for, for example, people who, um, for blind people to read with the fingers. So basically you'd have a pattern of dots under your fingers and you have a pattern on the screen and you compare the two. And you're supposed to report whether they are the same or not, whether what you feel under your fingers corresponds in terms of a pattern, spatial pattern, whether it corresponds to the stimulus that is shown on the screen. Okay, so the, it's a task, basically um, an integration task between um, sensory um, and visual um, uh, cortex. So the hypothesis here was that, well, if we need an integration between visual information and sensory information, the visual coming from the eyes and sensory coming from our fingers when we're doing this task, when people are good at the task, there should be a stronger interaction between what we feel under the fingers. So basically the processing of the sensory information and what we see the processing of the visual information. If they're bad at the task, probably that would lead to a weak interaction between the visual brain areas and the sensory brain, brain areas. So this is why I like this study because it's mechanistically, it has a nice hypothesis saying that if the integration of information between visual cortex and sensory cortex is important for the task, we should see stronger interaction between these two when we are successful and we should see worse interaction or weaker coupling or synchronization between these two areas when we perform bad or when we perform poorly in, in, in this task. So this is actually what they uh, actually were able to show and you can see this in the figure. Um, 
for the, the good trials, in other words, the good performance, you can see that there was an increase in coherence. So the, met, the metric used here is coherence. And it's actually a measure of coherence between, as you can see on the brain, uh, the position of the electrodes, O1, O2, are the electrodes over the visual cortex. Um, and then um, C3 um, and P3. So basically the electrodes over the sensory areas represent what's happening on the sensory cortex. And we are looking at the coherence of the signals between the two um, in a given frequency range, right? And so the, the, the trials where the performance was weak or poor, that's what you see in blue. And you can clearly see that between 600 or 700 milliseconds and 1,600 or 700 milliseconds in that gray um, area here in the, in the figure, that the coupling or the coherence is higher for trials where people perform good in this uh, visual sensory integration. And if they perform badly at it, during those trials, the interaction between these two areas is weak. In other words, this confirms the hypothesis. So I think this is a nice example. Obviously, you can visualize this over the, over the electrodes uh, topography uh, by looking at the, the strength of the coherence. Um, so this was a paper published in 2005, so quite some time ago, but I, I think it's, it's a very, very nice illustration of how, of the functional relevance of looking at interaction between two brain areas. Um, okay, so now um, let's come to the measures themselves, some a, a bit more methodological now details of how to measure these. Um, I'm going to go over some standard tools, so, such as cross-correlation, coherence, and phase synchrony. Um, there's the issue of inferring directionality of these interactions between brain areas. We'll talk about Granger causality and PDC and DTF. Um, there's an important point, which is trying to deal with what we call linear mixing, uh, related to phenomena such as volume conduction or the common pickup. There are tools for this. I will discuss some of them here. Um, and then I'll discuss some um, more recent trends um, over the last five years or so where people are exploring the use of phase amplitude coupling or cross-frequency interaction uh, metrics um, and others uh, to look at interactions. So let's start first of all with time domain metrics. Again, we're looking at time domain first and then we'll come to the frequency domain uh, implementations of some of these metrics. So a very a uh, standard approach to looking at interaction between two signals uh, or an association between two signals is using cross-correlation. And you see here the formula for cross-correlation. I'm sure mo many of you are aware of this. Um, this can be computed at zero time lag or at different time lags if you want between your two signals. And the values that you get from looking at cross-correlations um, basically will vary between minus one and one, right? Um, so this is basically a very standard metric, and this is also used in different uh, modalities, including fMRI, where you look at correlation between uh, the bold uh, signals in different brain areas. Um, now we're going to go straight to the frequency domain. As I said, this is a very important aspect of analyzing EEG and MEG data, is actually really going to the frequency domain and doing spectral analysis or time frequency analysis. So coherence, um, is basically a frequency domain equivalent of doing uh, correlation. So we're looking at the linear association between two signals. However, now it's not the time signals per se, we're looking at a specific frequency band within a specific frequency, um, how well the two signals are, um, are related to one another. And so, as I said, it's a measure of cross, uh, of cross correlation. Um, and it is um, absolute, um, one measure we use is absolute squared cross spectrum, um, which is shown here. You'll often see the term um, MS coherence, which is magnitude squared coherence. Um, what else can I tell you? Yeah, and the value here varies between zero and one. Uh, so one is going to be perfectly coherent um, uh, signals and um, zero would be no coherence at all. Um, and that's it. And you can, as I said, you can compute this for different frequencies, which makes it really interesting when you have some hypothesis about what's going on in the brain, for example, in the alpha range, you cannot look at alpha power, but you might want to look at alpha coherence. So in other words, interaction between two brain, you know, brain areas within the alpha frequency, okay? Um, another related metric is coherency. Now, as if I'm, I'm going to go back and forth between the two slides, you'll see what the difference is. We just talked about coherence, and now I'm telling you about coherency. Both are uh, as a function of frequency. So if I go here and here, you'll see 
maybe you spot the difference. In one case, you have this magnitude squared in the um, nominator for coherence, whereas coherence C is a complex metric. Um, so it has a real and an imaginary components, or you could also also split it into amplitude and phase. Okay, so it's a complex metric. Um, why is it useful? I will come back to this um, in, a, in, a, in a few moments when we talk about imaginary coherence. Now, um, another metric that you might see in the literature used quite a bit um, is what we call phase synchrony. So phase synchrony is a locking over some transient period of the relationship between the phases of two signals. In other words, when we, when we say phase locking, we mean that the difference between the two phases remains constant over some period of time, okay? So again, if two channels are coupled, they are more likely to show a consistent phase relationship. So if you have two signal oscillations doing the same thing, if you look at the phase of these two signals, you'll see that the difference between those two phases remains constant, at least over some period of time where these two signals are coupled. Okay. Um, one way to um, tap into this phenomenon is by using, um, by estimating the instantaneous phase uh, using the Hilbert transform, uh, but it can also be done using uh, the wavelet uh, transform. And there are many measures that have been developed, um, some of them by um, Jean-Philippe Lachaud back in 1999 and Peter Tass in 1998. Um, and unlike coherence, because this is a question that might arise, so how does it differ from coherence? Um, as its name suggests, phase synchrony only extracts phase information and looks at how the phases of two signals are related to one another. It does not take into account the amplitude. And this can be interesting if the underlying phenomenon is really a phase coupling between the two signals, taking amplitude into account, such as when you use coherence, um, might uh, mask actually the strength of this interaction, might, allow, might not allow you to see that these signals are nicely coupled. Also, it makes interpretation easier. If you actually say, well, I know it has nothing to do with amplitude. The amplitude can be high or low. The amplitude might not be related to the two signals, but it's really the phase relationship between these two signals that is critical. That's what the phase synchrony measure will be able to give you. Um, I will not go into this um, because I want to go a bit quicker, but basically there are, there are tools using surrogate data that allow you to um, investigate uh, the statistical significance um, of your metric. You can do that with statistics or you can do that with what has been called here the PLV, um, the phase locking value, uh, where, as, a, as a, well, I won't go into the details, but you can feel free to ask me questions about this. Basically here we shuffle the data to create surrogate data and reassess PLV on surrogate data and use that as a null distribution. So what about um, issues related to making interpretations of your interaction? And this is really important because there are uh, important caveats and important uh, uh, pitfalls related to um, assessing connectivity with EEG and MEG. Uh, the major issues are the three that I'm gonna go through now. The first one is distinguishing direct from indirect coupling. In other words, can we rule out that there's a common third source C? If I see that A and B seem to be synchronized, does that mean they're actually directly exchanging information like parietal and prefrontal? Are they really exchanging information? Or is there another area C, which let's say could be, um, let's say the thalamus, uh, that is connected to each one of these? And it looks like A and B are connected, but actually there is a third source that um, explain this uh, interaction. The second issue we need to be mindful of is detecting the direction of the interaction. So it is very important in certain experimental paradigms to know whether if you have an interaction between A and B, is that because A influences B as much as B influences A? Or is actually, is there a trend? Or can we actually say that the activity in A is driving the activity in area B? And thirdly, we need to distinguish uh, what we call true long range interactions from volume conduction effect or spurious interactions. By spurious interactions, we would mean something that is not at all a real interaction. And one example of that is, imagine you have one strong source in the brain of let's say alpha oscillation, 10 Hertz activity in the brain. It's very strong. Now that the activity of that brain area is captured by let's say two sensors. So a sensor 
in on the on, in prefront over prefrontal area and the sensor over parietal area, because that activity underlying there is so strong, it gets picked up by two sensors or by two electrodes. Now, what happens if you look at the synchronization between those two electrodes? You will find that they are synchronized, right? Because they have they share the same activity coming from that one common source. Does that mean that the prefrontal and parietal areas are exchanging information? No, it doesn't. It just means there's one strong underlying source gets picked up by these two sensors. And now you think you've identified some nice interaction between two brain areas. In fact, it's just a spurious connectivity. This is a third case that we need to be um, careful about and uh, be aware of. So now I'm going to give you some techniques of how we try to work around uh, these three um, issues um, in interpreting physiological interactions between brain areas. So the first one, um, would be to try and distinguish direct from indirect coupling, okay? So to know, is it another area that's causing this interaction uh, that I see between my two areas that I'm recording from? Um, and one tool to do this is basically partialing out, what we call partialing out the effect of a, a third channel C or source C when you're looking at the coupling between A and B. Uh, there are many metrics for this. Um, one of them is, for example, the use of partial coherence, which, tries to look at the interaction between A and B if I take into account the contribution of C. So if I take that into account, do I still find that there is an interaction between A and B or is that interaction lost and non-significant if I take into account the contributions of C? What about the second problem, uh, which was the directionality or causality um, issue? Um, as I said, we want, we, know, we want to do this to infer information flow or what we call also causation or what area is driving which other area. And there's uh, several techniques that can be used for this. One is um, estimating the, the lag in the phase if we're doing phase lag estimation. Another one is looking at Granger causality. This was, was invented in, in 1969 by, uh, by Granger. By Granger. Um, and there are frequency domain adaptations of this uh, metric, such as partial directed coherence, PDC, or directed transfer function. I'm not going to go into all of these details. Many of the, the codes for these um, are available, um, and, and you, can, you can easily play around with them. Um, what I would like to do, though, is give you a little bit more information about one of these methods that I think conceptually is interesting to, to understand. Uh, that's Granger causality. So let's talk now briefly about Granger causality. Granger, so Clive Granger was a um, Nobel Prize winner in economics, 2003. Um, so the technique that he proposed was not necessarily proposed for neuroscience, but basically dealing with, um, with signals of any type if you want to infer some causation or some um, causality between the two. And um, for those of you who have not heard about Granger causality before, I'm just gonna briefly walk, walk you through the actual concept and how it works. You'll, you'll see, it might sound a bit complex, but in the essence, it's quite simple. So basically the idea is that if you have um, a signal in Y and a signal X over time, um, what you want to do is you want to see whether, if you want to make a prediction of the signal X, does including the past of that signal X to predict the, the current value of X, can you do better than that if you also include the past of another signal y. In other words, if including the past of another signal y improves your estimate of the current value of your signal x more than just using the past of x itself, then that other signal y is actually causing the signal x. Okay, so there is a flow of information because if you take it into consideration, you are better at estimating the value of x than using just the past of x itself. This is um, one um, definition of causality. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. There, might, there are other definitions of causality. So this is why in some cases you'll see, it doesn't happen often enough, but in some cases people will say, um, signal Y Granger causes signal X in the sense that it has been computed based on Granger causality in terms of metric. Um, so again, um, pairwise Granger causality will not distinguish between direct and indirect causal influences because you can still have another signal Z that is involved in this, in this flow of information. This is why we now come to this other form which is called conditional Granger causality. And here what you would do is you can take, you try to look at the effect of uh, including or not 
another signal Z, which comes back to what I mentioned before, you partial out the contribution of the source Z, um, and you see if you still have this uh, directional coupling between Y and X. Okay, now, um, as I said, there are frequency domain adaptations of the Granger, domain, of the Granger causality. There is frequency domain Granger, per se, but there's also partial directed coherence, PDC, and directed transfer function. Uh, and there are some papers that have tried to look at, uh, to compare these techniques. Um, if you're interested, you can, you can check them out. Um, I will not go much into the multivariate autoregressive models. Um, I provided some information here, so you, they will be available in the slides. You can just go check them out. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over this. I'm going to go uh, to the third uh, issue, which is the issue of volume conduction or field spread. In other words, this was the case where you have, for example, just one source and captured by several electrodes. And if you look at the coupling between the electrodes, you'd think you might have interaction between brain areas. But in, in essence, it's just one source somewhere, so it's a spurious connectivity. One way to work around this and to avoid this problem, I say one way because there are other tools, one way is using imaginary part of coherency. I did say imaginary part of coherency, not of coherence. It's because if you recall from the beginning of this talk, coherency is the complex version of coherence. So it has a real and an imaginary part. And I will just show you in a second how this works. Um, up on the top right here, you see the formula for coherency. Um, where you have the uh, cross um, uh, spectra divided by the auto spectra of your signals, so that's the power. Um, and the real part, and this is the important information here, contains the instantaneous coherence. Okay, so that's the zero phase lag. Whereas the imaginary part of coherency contains the phase lag coherence. So any interaction that happens at zero phase is what we call instantaneous coherence or uh, instantaneous uh, interaction that's gonna be captured entirely within the real part of coherency. But anything that um, reflects non-zero phase lag, so in other words, a relationship between two signals where the phase difference is not zero, that's gonna be entirely captured within the imaginary part of coherency. And so maybe now some of you see the idea behind this, um, and this was um, a proposal that came from Guido Nolte um, several years ago. Um, Based on this observation that volume conduction itself is instantaneous, obviously it's going to be also captured by the real part. So now the idea was, well, okay, what, what happens if we just focus on the imaginary part of coherency, the one that assumes that you have to have some phase lag between your two signals? That component will not be affected by volume conduction. So that component will be immune, theoretically speaking, to volume conduction. Um, so Nolte in 2004 proposed the use of imaginary coherence, uh, component of coherence to assess true interactions. The underlying idea is that if imaginary coherence shows you some significant interaction, then you can be sure that that's true and that's not caused by volume conduction. However, it is an underestimation of coherence because within the real part, you might have volume conduction. Um, but you might have also true zero, fa zero phase interactions. So if there are brain errors that interact at zero phase, you would also capture that with the real part of, uh, of coherence. But if you're not sure that it might, could also be related to spurious interactions, then you're being more stringent by saying, well, maybe there is something zero phase in my coherence, which is true, which is actually neuronal interactions. But I'm just gonna ignore that. I'm gonna focus on the imaginary part of coherency because if I find something there, I know it cannot be explained by volume conduction. Um, basically, the, the following slides I'm going to skip over because they just explain exactly what I just said by showing you how um, part of this is, gets embedded within the real uh, component, uh, real part of coherency, and uh, the other comes from, goes to the imaginary part of, uh, of coherency. Um, the T1s and the T2s basically are the lags between the two signals. Um, so you can, you, can, you can go through over those if you want later on. The, the, um, the take home message from the imaginary part of coherency is that uh, it will not detect true zero phase coupling if it happens to exist in your data because it's being very stringent and conservative and will only focus on the non-zero phase interactions. 
Um, so it can underestimate your company. But at least whatever you see, you know, it's, there are high chances that it's real and it's not caused by spurious interactions. Um, yeah, there are, have been a number of papers in 2009, 2007 that look, look at these uh, interactions and simulate the effects of these uh, spurious interactions. So feel free to check them out if you're interested. Um, now a quick point related to um, connectivity uh, in source space. Um, clearly going to source space improves your interpretation. Okay, because you're adding in some anatomical information. Um, you can also do your group level statistics um, in a common normalized source space, uh, like for example, the MNI uh, brain. Um, and the question is, well, does this solve the full split issue? Can we now say, well, I'm doing this in source space, so there's no, there's no issue about, um, I, I don't have to worry anymore um, about the, conduct, the volume spread to the sensors and the volume conduction issues. And that's not true because of the linear mixing. Because when you're doing your inverse problem, the fact that these different sensors, electrodes, capture activity from, the, from, from specific sources, that they get injected into different sensors, when you're doing the inverse, you will also have a reflection of that in your source space data. So there are several strategies to, um, to tackle this. Um, when we do a source space connectivity analysis uh, in EG and MEG, we can either, we have two procedures. Either we're doing source estimation, uh, first, and then we do a connectivity analysis. This is what I refer to here as being a two-step procedure. First, I estimate my sources, and then I run connectivity analysis. Um, estimating sources can be done using a minimum norm estimate or spatial filters. Um, and then when I'm doing the connectivity analysis, then I can, for example, choose a reference. If I'm interested in what's happening in motor cortex, I can take motor, motor cortex activity as a reference and compute its uh, coupling with all other signals from all other brain areas across across the mesh of the brain. That would be one approach, but that means that I have a hypothesis uh, that I think motor cortex is coupled to other areas and I'm, I'm testing that with a seed-based analysis. Um, the other approach would be to do an all-to-all -all, um, interaction. So we're doing basically an inter a connectivity matrix between all brain areas um, that sometimes can turn out to be um, problematic if you're using, let's say, 20,000 by 20,000 nodes of your brain. Um, and so you might want to consider some dimensionality reduction techniques, or you might want to move down to ROIs, uh, regions of interest, to reduce the, the, the space um, of those interactions. Now B, now this is another um, strategy that can be used. Um, and this is um, what has been proposed um, through uh, DCM, dynamic cause modeling, is to actually simultaneously estimate source time series and connectivity. So you have a, a generative model of what's going on, and you're, you're actually looking simultaneously at the activity in these specific areas and the interactions between them. Um, this means that you need to uh, choose a model and define what are your ROIs, um, and opens up the questions of what are your criteria for that, and uh, do you have several potential models that you want to test? Um, I just wanted to highlight that this is um, also something that some, some groups do. Um, and I won't discuss the details of the DCM. You'll find some information here on the slides uh, if you want to dig more into, in, into that. It is doable with um, fMRI, but also with MEG and EEG data through the uh, SPM toolbox, for instance. So there are more tools to look at interaction. Uh, one of them is using long-range cross-frequency coupling. So cross-frequency, something I mentioned before, this is the interaction between um, activity in different frequencies. This can be done locally. So if you have a signal in one location, you can look at the relationship between, let's say, its low frequency component and its high frequency component. Um, one metric for that is phase amplitude coupling. And you can do that for one channel, just one signal or one source activity in the brain, right? But you can also apply the same technique to look at interaction between areas. So you can look at the relationship between phase at a given frequency from area A and how that is coupled to the amplitude at another frequency, most of the time a higher frequency like gamma, for instance, in another area B. So you're, you're looking at cross-frequency interactions between two brain areas. So it's a, you know, it's something that I would recommend doing after having a look at within frequency interactions, um, because it's um, it's a more complex measure, slightly more complex. It's not easy. It's not difficult to compute, uh, but the interpretations are a bit more tricky. 
So I would definitely recommend you doing within frequency analysis first of interactions, and then moving on to cross frequency interactions, both locally and across brain areas. Um, there's another me metric called biphase uh, locking value, uh, which is a nonlinear coupling metric. Um, the metric that um, is often used um, and we often use in our lab is phase lag index, um, which also has some very nice properties that makes it um, immune to some of the, um, the, the, uh, the volume conduction of field spread issues because it only looks at non-zero phase interactions. Um, you can also look at power correlations between orthogonal signals. So this is basically an amplitude-amplitude metric um, after applying some tricks, again, to um, exclude zero-phase um, interactions. Um, and last but not least, um, I obviously haven't, don't have the time here to go through all of the details of this, but graph theoretical approaches are, as you all know, um, an essential proponent of the tools that are available to us today if you want to assess interactions and assess connectivity from, from brain data. Um, it's, a whole, it's, a, it's a huge field with many, many potential metrics, um, some more easy, some more complex to interpret um, when you apply it to your data. But I definitely also recommend taking a look at graph theoretical metrics. Um, I will very briefly give you just one example of how we applied Granger causality now to a real example of data. This is intracranial EEG data coming from the human brain during um, an error monitoring task. So this is a task where people make mistakes. And um, this is work we published in 2017 uh, or 16. Um, and basically, we looked, I just, I'm just not going to go through the paper. I'm just going to show you some examples of how we use Granger causality to assess this notion of direction of information flow within brain data, okay? So the task here was quite simple. It's a, a stop signal task, an STS task. The stop signal task is very easy. Basically, you, there's a signal that tells you to press a button. And in some cases, about third to 33% of the cases, you'll have a second signal just after that telling you not to press, basically withhold from pressing the button. And so sometimes you'll be able to achieve that and sometimes you'll make a mistake. So basically you'll be waiting for the signal, the signal comes and you press a button as fast as you can, but sometimes within the first uh, 500 milliseconds, there's a second signal, which is a stop signal. And basically this is what you see on the right-hand side with that small cross. The stop trials will tell you, no, nope, don't press. And so you need to quickly inhibit the button press um, command that you had planned to do. Sometimes you'll be able to do that, and sometimes you'll make a mistake and you will go press, realize sometimes even while doing that, that, that was not the right thing to do. And um, that will generate an error signal in your brain. Now we know that the insula and anterior cingular cortex play an important role in um, error monitoring and error awareness. So the task that the, what we tried to do in this study here, using direct recordings from patients that had electrodes within ACC, anterior singlet cortex, and anterior insula, to try and have look at the relationship between the activity in these two structures during an error monitoring task. This is described in more detail in the paper. I'm just going to show you one result where you can see how Granger causality as a measure of direction. Um, directional, a directional measure of connectivity or of information flow can be useful to make some interpretations. So again, the question here is um, who plays a major role in identifying that we've made an error while we do that error? In other words, you press a button and you know right away I shouldn't have done that. That error awareness is the major role played by the anterior uh, cingulate cortex that will identify that and send information to the insula, which are, both these structures are part of the error monitoring network, or is it going to be the insula that will identify that th there was a mistake uh, made and will in send some information to the anterior cingulate cortex, potentially in terms of adaptive behavior and ensuring that these things don't happen in the past and so on and so forth. So the question is, who's leading who? Is it the ACC or the insula? And so to do that, we applied Granger causality, and we applied it specifically on for trials where the, the individuals pressed the button and it was a correct button press. They were supposed to do that, so everything's fine. And we also looked at that Granger causality between these two structures when they press the button and realizing while pressing the button, I should not have done that. This is an error. This is a mistake. Why did I do this? Okay, so what you see in orange are 
is over time, the Granger causality metric, the, so the direction of, inf of information flow, basically we take the difference between information from A to B and B to A. If it's positive, it means that the ACC is leading AI, um, anterior insula. If the value is below zero, it means basically that the anterior insula is leading or driving the activity in anterior cingulate cortex. And as you can see from these two subjects, patient one, uh, patient four and patient two, the orange curves during the error show that specifically during errors, the information from AI drives the activity in ACC. What happens if the, um, if the response was correct? We see the other way around. It's the activity from ACC that drives the activity in anterior insula. So this is a very neat example where you can see that the direction of information between two brain areas can change depending on the cognitive processes that are at hand. We can have one area like ACC driving the activity of the insula as long as I'm pressing the button correctly and all of a sudden I press the button and that was a mistake and I go, oh shoot, I should not have done that. At that moment, there is information from insula that now is driving the information um, in anterior cingulate cortex. And it is here an example of how Granger causality as a metric allows to identify this. There's obviously much more detailed in the paper uh, that you can check out. Um, okay, so I'm going to finish off with some rules of um, good conduct when investigating long-range connectivity with MEG and EEG. You need to keep in mind that um, changes in your signal-to-noise ratio, so the quality of your data and um, the, the ratio between the signal component and the noise component um, of, your, of your signal, um, that that can have... Um, if, it's a, if, if the signal-to-noise ratio changes across your experimental conditions, that might have an effect on your ability to robustly and reliably assess uh, coupling, right? Because that's gonna change your ability to measure this connectivity. So if you have a change in connectivity, you need to make sure it is a task-based change in connectivity, not just because in one task I have more noise than in the other, okay? Secondly, um, this weak uh, SNR may result in um, less accurate estimates of your phase. So what appears as a change in phase across conditions might just be simply caused by the sensitivity of phase uh, detection to um, noise. <coughs> um, the possible effect of third source might also be impossible to identify um, because this might be a hidden source that you're not um, able to access. So this is just something to keep in mind. So the question always that arises, okay, what can we do to act in at least um, make more robust or reliable claims and not fall into any of these uh, traps. First of all, I think we need to be aware and we need to acknowledge the limitations of each measure that you use. So be very critical about uh, the measure. So when you find the result, you report them. If it's in line with your hypothesis and it addresses your question nicely, then that's good. But always keep in mind that you should always add a couple of sentences saying, well, the specificities of, of the metrics that I used um, might need uh, further investigation with other metrics to make sure that what we measured was not um, influenced by this or the, this other um, artifact that could have also explained the data. So be very critical um, because if you want, if you don't do that, then the reviewers will be critical anyway. So you might as well be very critical yourself when you report your results. Um, also, you need to uh, limit the possible effect of confounding factors. So you can do that by, for example, increasing the power um, um, of your analysis by having more trials and things like that or using stratification techniques. Um, I'm not going to go into all these details but I'm, I'm providing them here so you can feel free to ask me later. You can use conditional coupling metrics um, to diminish the effect of volume conduction um, or, the, or, the, or the presence of a third a driving source um, by partially out the effect of these sources. Um, as I said, imaginary coherence is one tool uh, among others, uh, like phase lag uh, index, uh, PLI is another one that you can consider using. Um, if you have prior knowledge of about physiology, I think it's useful to use it. Um, so if, in other words, doing there's nothing wrong about doing seed-based uh, connectivity analysis if that addresses the hypothesis that you have. Um, and there are, as I said, ways of increasing uh, signal to noise ratio and making sure that if you're running, if you're actually designing the experiment, not just receive data from somebody that you want to analyze, but if you're actually designing your own experiment, think very carefully about what metrics do you plan to apply 
once the data is there, because then you can, it will help you make some important decisions about the experimental design so that you don't get trapped later down the line saying, oh, I should have used twice as many trials, for example. Um, the question that all often arises is what connectivity approach works best? And I would like to say there isn't one approach that is the best, uh, me metric that is the best, but there are different approaches that you can, you can explore. So you can try a combination of tools, but I would recommend starting simple. So start with some very simple metrics, and then you can go to more complex metrics to see if you can assess more information. For example, start with a metric that is not directional. And once you find that there is interaction, maybe you would want to look at directionality using a more sophisticated technique. Optimizing experiment design, as I just mentioned before. And also one thing that could be of interest is you may want to look at coupling and how it changes um, across different um, populations, not only different um, yeah. experimental tasks, but you, if you have access, for example, to resting state across um, healthy controls and Alzheimer's or schizophrenia or depression um, patients, um, then you can actually compare these metrics across the two. Um, and that would be another way of both understanding how these connectivity changes in the case of pathology but will also inform you about the role that connectivity between brain, specific brain areas plays in healthy cognition. To conclude, MEG and EEG connectivity analysis, I think is an extremely promising field. There has been a lot of research over the last 10 to 15 years showing the, the power of these, of these tools. And I think there are still many more uh, exciting um, uh, findings that we'll be following from this field of research. Um, and I think, this is also why, because there's a lot of interest in this, this, this is also why it is so important to use these methods very critically and also understand and acknowledge possible confounds when using these uh, metrics uh, on your data. Um, there's a long list here of exhaustive tools that can be used, um, but I, I think I mentioned many tools in my talk earlier on, including open source tools based on um, Python, but also on MATLAB. Um, so there's, there's a lot to play around with. Um, and to finish, I'd like to say that detecting connectivity from non-invasive measurements is, is a bit like a fishing expedition, especially when you do this non-invasively, because you don't really know what's happening underneath the hood, um, but you're trying to disentangle true interactions from just spurious interactions. Um, but there's a lot of big fish that can be caught, because there's a lot of things that you can learn about the brain by applying these interaction metrics to non-invasive data. Um, I think that's, yeah, that was the end of um, of my contribution here, this uh, second talk on, on measuring interactions. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions if you uh, if you have some. Um, so, uh, Karim, I don't know if you see on the chat. Uh, maybe I can re read for uh, everyone. Uh, Tiana has a question. Uh, thank you for the talk. What if I need to measure effective connectivity between two brain areas that have SNR difference and confounds JC directionality, so Granger causality directionality? So basically, can uh, differences on, on, in SNR uh, mess uh, directionality in Granger causality? Yes, basically differences in SNR in principle are going to mess up everything. So if you have them across conditions, if you have them across brain areas, that can mess around. But what you can work around that, for example, if you assume that even those differences in SNR are going to stay stable um, across uh, individuals and you have two conditions, then you might be able to exclude that by saying, well, I'm, I know that there might not, so across the two areas, it's not the same. Um, but they're still not the same in condition A and also in condition B, they're not the same. So now if you're comparing your experimental condition A, for example, in a case where you're paying attention to the stimulus, in another case where you're distracted, if you have these differences between the two areas in both, um, in both these tasks, then you can sort of minimize the effect of that. So in general, obviously it's, it's a nuisance to have um, differences in SNR. Uh, but in practice, it has never really stopped anyone from conducting a reliable study, I would say. Um, and again, I think good rule of conduct is always report that. If you have a way of assessing and identifying that there is indeed an issue with SNR, 
and that there are differences in SNR, I think you should be transparent about it and report it and say that it might somehow have an effect. But as I said, you can work around it specifically if you're comparing conditions where you think that that difference is maintained across your conditions. I mean, in, in, in uh, fMRI, Granger causality is also a very uh, somewhat co controversial uh, technique. Uh, Steve Smith from the Oxford fMRIP uh, group published a, a very large scale simulation study a couple of years back in one of, uh, well, almost a decade back now. Uh, one of the conclusions was that differences in uh, hemodynamics properties in the brain, which we'll talk about tomorrow morning, uh, can actually uh, confound directionality and Granger causality. And so lots of people have started deciding that basically Granger causality couldn't be applied in fMRI. And uh, you're going to have reviewers even today who basically refuse to, to let papers coming out with that type of technique in fMRI. Now there's a pushback on that because I think, I mean, the issues are well documented. And there, there are ways to work around some some degree as well in, in fMRI, but it's definitely one of those uh, you know yeah. more controver controversial techniques. Uh, yes, yeah. absolutely, and it's it's less so in MEG and EEG, um, but clearly in fMRI it has been criticized a lot. Um, I think in in MEG and EEG it's it's rather accepted uh, generally as a, as I said, it also has different forms. You can do it in, in frequency space and in, in time space. Um, but there are other metrics for, for, uh, for directionality that are also um, implemented. So there was a couple of follow-up questions. Do phase coherency-based techniques compensate for the SNR problem while giving directionality? So... Um, it's sort of a technical question, but I, I would like to say no, because um, in a sense that even estimating phase is basically going to depend on, on your SNR. So you, you might have, I mentioned this towards the end, if you have a bad estimate of phase because you have low SNR, basically you're estimating a crappy phase. And so then your, your, um, your, uh, your conclusion about phase relationships can be um, uh, erroneous and just wrong. Just because SNR led you to identify a wrong or a poor estimation of your phase. High signal to noise ratio will give you beautiful signals and estimating phase out of those beautiful signals is gonna be easy and robust and reliable. If you have a lot of noise, then the estimation of your phase is going to be crappy. And so your estimate of phase interactions is gonna be crappy too. Garbage in, garbage out. Low SNR, low SNR, you know, there's not much we can do here. Yeah. Other questions still from Tiana. Uh, can amplitude coupling connectivity measure, such as cross correlation, for example, also give information on connectivity directions? Um, I think you can infer those if you're using, for example, uh, time delays in your assessment of correlation um, across your time um, your time series for your for your amplitudes. Uh, it's not really uh, used uh, that much. Um, people, I think mechanistically, the idea of phase uh, is much more attractive in terms of, at least from my perspective, in terms of mechanistic delays between brain areas and within a given frequency. Um, but yes, I think you could technically try to assess um, those um, um, directionalities with amplitude, but um, I, I would be wary of those. I, I would, I would be, feel more comfortable by using uh, PLI, for instance, uh, phase lag index, um, and a version of which uh, you, you can make sure you, you could use PLI to look at these phase delays, um, and that, that would give you more robust information, I think. Um, am amplitude coupling is, is definitely worth exploring. Orthogonalized envelopes uh, can help you avoid zero phase lag um, instantaneous um, interactions that might result from um, field spread of volume conduction. Um, so th there's a paper by Jürgen Hipp on this. Um, yeah, so I, I, I personally prefer phase-based information. I find it mechanistically easier to, to interpret. Yeah, so the, the, the phase, so Tian is asking about the PLI. Um, the, 
the, if you look at the paper, um, the original papers that uh, presented PLI, um, um, I, the name of the author now eludes me, but basically the, in the formulation of PLI, before you get to the last formulation where you lose the information of, of directionality, um, you can actually stop a step before and you will actually have those phase lags. So if the phase lags are positive or negative, that will give you the information uh, about directionality. Um, the PLI per se, the generic value of PLI that comes out of the toolbox will just give you an overall metric of that, of that without giving you the direction. Uh, 